I have to tell you guys, uh, I, having spent several months now having to do just history lectures, I'm loving the change of pace. <laughs> but, but my ability to create a PowerPoint for it is very different. It's a different process. So we'll see how this one goes. Uh, so bear with me. Those online and, and future YouTubers who have to watch this, go through this slideshow. I apologize in advance. But good evening. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, the discussion tonight is uh, we're going to be talking about how we approach practice, um, the manner and deportment we take when we do our practice. Uh, I love talking about this personally. Uh, it's something I feel passionately about, I'm probably only because I really like ritual. Um, but that's me. Uh, but uh, this, again, is, is kind of important uh, for the Sangha as well. Uh, we haven't talked about it in a long time and have a lot of newer faces, uh, since, especially since COVID, um, to our Sangha and, and especially our online community. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so we haven't covered it in a long time. Here we are. Uh, I know it's surprising, but um, how we are is important. How we approach practice, how we settle into practice, and how we come out of practice is important. And when all that's done as a Sangha, there are additional considerations that we have to make uh, about how all that happens. However, the outcomes and the benefits are greater, I believe. But I hope to provide a gestalt on how to be in our practice and how we approach our practice by extension reflects how we approach our daily lives. As I discuss some of these concepts, much of it falls under terms of etiquette or deportment. And etiquette implies a certain set of usually polite ways of being that help set a tone for a group of people. And deportment is the behaviors of how one actually demonstrates that etiquette. And I will say some things are going to be very much Hondo specific, so uh, our space, our temple specific, um, our service specific. Uh, but what, we'll, what I'll be describing can also be applied to how we do our own daily practice. I don't want those, especially online, to assume that this won't apply to you because it really does. These things uh, can, that, that, uh, can be brought into, if not already are instinctually in place, in your own practice. Uh, in fact, we even add a document in each of the emails that goes out uh, to those online about the online etiquette one should follow for the benefit of others online. And here, I'll make a point that I know that those who are joining us from afar, I know at least half of you will leave after this discussion. Um, and I know that half of those folks will leave after the ritual, before the meditation. And I want to stay. That's okay. I get that. I understand why. I would hope that you would stay, but I get it. Watching and participating through a camera and screen is not the same as being in person. There is a qualitative difference. At least we've been able to provide it, and I'm again glad that they're here. But so watching us do service may not be interesting or as engaging or as rewarding. And this, I feel, reinforces the importance of Sangha and why I wanted to present on this topic. I believe that it is how we are when we come together that creates the difference of that in-person or not. I tell anyone who's joining us online that we are grateful for you being here and we're so glad that the Tendai teachings have meant something to you, enough to join us from afar. But still, find a local Sangha and be present at that, because it is meaningful to be with others, and you can use this discussion as how to be in that Sangha. Because when we know how to be with each other, we can let our guard down. We can humble up, open ourselves, and blur the lines of individuality. And that's what I would call harmony. We're trying to create harmony and meaning 
through our actions. So again, if you are not part of a local Sangha, take these at least as consideration of how to approach and create harmony in your own personal practice. Right? Because what I would say is that this type of etiquette and deportment is not just for when people are watching. It's not just for when people are watching. It's not solely for the other people's benefit. Although it is, <laughs> and we'll get to that part. But that's how we approach our practice. It says something about ourselves. It's our state of mind. And it says more than what we might imagine. There is a general agreed upon code of conduct that helps to create, practice, and maintain harmony. We conform to all sorts of these codes of conduct all the time. We can imagine driving without the rules of the road. Mm. There's a certain amount of trust, assumptions of how to be with each other, so that we can have, at least, if not harmony, at least no accidents. <laughs> and we also know what it feels like when someone disrupts that harmony. It can really rattle us. It almost I don't know, it feels disrespectful. And, and I think that that's where this type of conduct, or what we're going to be talking about, sets itself apart. Because underlying how to be in practice is, practice is really how much do you care, how you show that respect, how do you demonstrate its importance to you. This is the kind of thing we're going to be talking about. How we behave around the doing of our practice matters, even when we're alone. So we're going to go over some of the basic considerations that can help us all approach our religious practice with more grace and harmony, more intention and meaning. And this is great timing. Uh, full disclosure, next month here at the Betsuin, we're going to be holding the Betsuin Go, which is the priests in training. And to be true, frank, frank with this, it, we spend most of our time on this. How we conduct ourselves in ritual, in how we clean, in how we eat. And so a lot of time is spent so that these future aspiring priests know how to lead a service, carry a tone, be in sync with each other, so that they can model for their sangha. The doshi, the leader of the service, sets the cadence, the tone of voice. Then as a sangha, we meet that tone, fall into that rhythm, as we stop paying attention to ourselves in order to start feeling a synchrony with those around us. And thus, we harmonize. Imagine if a priest leading that service didn't care was a little sloppy, not graceful, not harmonious. Hmm. What? Thank you so much. <clears throat> so many people here already know what that feels like to be in the hondo, doing service. All I'm providing, at least for those here, uh, uh, I'm providing a way to deepen the practice, deepen the meaning within it. Because at least we get to do the practice. We, that means that we have to show up. We have a chance of time and opportunity to be able to practice. And that should be cherished. We should treat it with reverence and gratitude. And for the Sangha, we honor the fact that others, too, are showing up to be, uh, to be here as a group. Not because we care about our own personal practice, or well-being, but because we care about the well-being and practice of the other. Showing up means a lot. And when we show up before practice is even done, we can start to demonstrate that reverence and gratitude through cleaning. Jiri, Saicho, Dogen, all their meditation and practice manuals first start with cleaning. Making a space. 
Thankfully, Louise comes and does it for us in the Hondo every week. And Matt helps. <laughs> and, and Matt, and, and Matt, thank you so much. And today, Tony X showed up. Oh, that's true. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, right? So we're always looking for those volunteers. No. We're giving you the opportunity to show your gratitude. No. <laughs> so, yeah. like, how you set things up and maintain the cleanliness matters. It's something we have to do to show how we care. Then how we walk into the hondo, walk into our altar space at home, it's part of practice. We're not rushing in off the street from bad traffic, plop ourselves on the cushion. We are quietly reflective, calming our mind. The walking into that space is an entering into, a leaving behind of the outside. It is customary to leave shoes at the door as a way to demonstrate that leaving behind. We have slats of wood in the entryway, as you can see. And it is a liminal space between the inside and outside. The tile is outside, the less pure, where we leave shoes pointing outwards, waiting for our return. And I'll say here, pointing outwards is distinctive because if they were to point in, it's actually a sign of not leaving the space. It's a sign of death. Someone's entering and not planning on exiting. So we leave them ready for us to leave, knowing that at the end of our time inside, we'll have to go back out. That's a digression. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so a lot of people say that's, that's just really Japanese. I get it. Yeah, I mean, it is. Um, but only because Japan's a Buddhist nation. I feel like a lot of times what we consider Japanese culture is really Buddhist culture having influence. Yeah. Okay, anyway, yeah, I digress. Um, so yeah, the tile is outside, and the planks are a way to be able to enter into the inside. This is, uh, the shoes uh, don't go on the planks, and our feet don't go on the tile. It's creating a shift. And so this is also where we, as we're coming inside, where we may don some of our vestments of various types. Those who have taken refuge get a hagesa, uh, a half kesa, we wear around our necks. Some folks have a nenju or a juzu, some prayer beads, things that are worn. But these things should be worn. They are an outward sign of what we are doing inside. It's a way to demarcate practice time from daily lifetime. It's a way to represent the robes, harken back to the rag robes Shakyamuni Buddha created for himself when leaving the palace. It set him apart, showing those around him the type of life he's leading. Therefore, these things should be cared for, not shoved in a pocket. If you ever uh, notice in the Genkan, for those who are here, Monchin and Shumon senses, uh, they have a, a fan, a book, their kesa, and a juzu sitting on top in a row, neat, orderly, precise. It is never sloppy. How much time do you think it really takes them to do that? To really just show a little bit of reverence as to how they place their stuff. How much time does it take to show a little bit of caring? Okay. Then we enter into the actual main hall by stepping over the threshold. That step into that space is special. And recognizing the main image, the Honzong, we, we bow in Gasho. That simple bow can demonstrate a lot of meaning. If it is quick, uh, what I call a drive-by gasho, um, <laughs> or, or do we actually stop 
and allow ourselves to feel a gratitude, a, a humility. And, when, and in that moment, then bow. How much time? <laughs> this is the, I, we'll, we'll get back to it. <clears throat> we bow every time we walk in front of the Honzon. Every time we cross the, uh, cross the main hall, it, we cross the, uh, cross the image, we stop and bow. Um, I'm doing this when I'm going about my day whenever I cross in front of my altar at home. You know, um, it's a show of reverence. We don't, we don't um, show our, the bottoms of our feet to the Hanzon, to the main image. Mm -hmm. Monshin Sensei, during the, during the stretches and things at the end of meditation, he, he in fact turns when he is bent over as to not show his tukas to, to the main image, right? <laughs> The piece of wood doesn't care, right? We care. We want to show that respect. So we do it. It's a moment in time to show it. When we come into our seat at the hondo, we bow to the hondo. We bow to the space across. And I say space because it's not always a person there. But it's a space. Whether someone's there or not, we show a respect. We gather quietly as we settle in, we quiet ourselves, and we start to let all that outside go and open ourselves up a bit. Then we start service. And here, I quickly go over the elements of the daily service. So they are made more, uh, made a little bit with more attention. So bear with me, because we all know a lot of this. But we start with Sanrai, the three prostrations. This is a supplication. It's a humble ask for refuge, for a safe haven, for solace. We prostrate to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. We bow down, we, we hold them on high, we touch our head to the floor as we are imagining the Buddha sitting on our hands as we lift them above us. Joju Sambo. And we lift them. Once we expressed our humility, now we're able to enter into the practice. The ritual opens, the service begins, and we first recite Sangye Ma, a repentance. It's simple yet profound recognition that we are not perfect and have made mistakes and will make mistakes. But it's a rededication to improve. I always thought it was really tough to imagine, but I, I try to think of it as I'm, again, I know I'm going to make a mistake, but if I can improve maybe 1%, if I could have 1% less to repent about, <laughs> you know, a little more gratitude, a little bit more compassion, every day, 1%. That's 350%, you know, a year is like a lot, you know? But day by day. Kaikyoge, is a, it's a veneration, a gratitude for the teachings we're about to hear. Foreshadowing, uh, spoiler alert, it's the Heart Sutra. Um, <laughs> we, we, we venerate because we recognize the rarity to which we have a chance to encounter the teaching. Truth. It's noteworthy. Hearing the Dharma is compared to a blind turtle sea turtle, floating in the vast ocean, only to find one piece of driftwood to help him along his way. So it's a gratitude. Then the pinnacle, the apex of the service, the teaching itself, the, the sutra, in this case, the heart sutra. So all of that, <laughs> to be able to set the tone for the most important part of the service. We've quieted ourselves, humbled ourselves, repented, and shown gratitude. 
just to be able to chant and hear the sutra. So then when we go about chanting it, it's a little slumped. It's a little mumbly. Come on! Let's chant! Out loud! Put some emphasis on it! You know? I, again, open up. Sync with others. Chant with them. Listen to them. What's the cadence? Where's the pitch? What's the note? What sounds good with everyone? Harmonize! <laughs> we can't chant. How we chant can show what we're feeling. If you've taken Kaikyoke to heart, then you should be belting it. If not to rouse yourself, at least do it for someone else. Help it feel better for them. Inspire them. <coughs> if you're feeling down, low energy, fatigue, whatever, fair play, I get it. Trust me. <laughs> Nothing's wrong with that. All I'm saying is that if you do chant louder, I can almost guarantee your mind, your body will feel more invigorated. The sutra then leads to a mantra recitation. The particular mantra depends on your main image and, and any other Buddha or Bodhisattva you wish to invoke. And that's what it is. It's, it's an invocation, a tapping into, a calling to the kokoro, the heart, spirit, mind, the qualities of that Buddha Bodhisattva. By calling to mind Yakshi Nyorai, the medicine Buddha, the Hanzon and Arhando, by venerating and uttering that mantra, we are healed or better able to heal ourselves, each other, our world. The mantra is a, another teaching we receive. Then Hogo is a gratitude to the entire lineage, all the way back to Shakyamuni Buddha. Through GE, the founder of Tiantai in China, and Saicho, the founder of Tendai in Japan. But what is implied is also those, all those unnamed among that entire line. Without even a single one of them, we would not be here. <coughs> Without the Buddha's main disciples, Shariputra, Mahamadhyana, uh, Mahakashipa, uh, the later sages of Vasubandhu and Nagarjuna and all the way to Ichishima Sensei's father, Ichishima Sensei, Monshin Sensei. This is our lineage, where we've come from. Hogo, Hogo is a recognition of that karma, those causes that caused causes so that we could be here. It's worthy of awe and praise. And, and finally, all that we have experienced and learned in the practice is shared with others. The benediction, the so echo. It emphasizes our wholesome desire to work for the benefit of others. It's a selfless act. It's a recognition that the world changes as we can in, and, in, and we can influence that change, not for ourselves, but for everyone and everything. We are smoothing the ripples in the water to make them a little less choppy, bringing about harmony and equanimity. And we finish the service with another sunrise, as another show of humility. And now we're more ready to meditate. <laughs> What a preamble. <laughs> Do you need, need service before meditation? No. 
But ritual can be a meditation, too. Or at least to help one sink into a more meaningful meditation. But only if you bring meaning to the ritual. And hopefully, the mind and body have settled for that meditation. Thus, during meditation, we refrain from too much noise, respecting the harmony being created with others. <clears throat> if we need to clear our throat, do we have the presence of mind to do it discreetly? <clears throat> to ask to not disturb those around us? Are we fidgety on our cushions, our seats? Because if we need to find a, a seat that better works for you and find your comfort, let's establish that outside of practice time. Are you asleep? Or even worse, snoring? Uh, it's a time to allow our Buddha nature, our seed of awakening, to shine forth, to take the lead. Are you really going to sleep through that? <laughs> Again, it, the time is precious. We want to have that meditation, that practice period, be as fruitful as possible. And if you're doing it with others, yeah, you have to be more considerate. Be more aware of what's going on around you. Helping to maintain that harmony. Not to disrupt it. Not to stand out from it. But hopefully, when we have a group who all bring that same in, uh, wholesome intention, feeling, caring, we meet, we harmonize, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> that feeling, I love that feeling. It, it feels right. It lifts me up, personally. But all in all, the way we are, the way we come to practice, can allow us to experience connection without getting ourselves in the way. We come together and we have a transformative experience. Okay. This etiquette seems simple, but the application of it is tough. We can become mindless of it, if not, well, hopefully mindful of it. Therefore, the behavior the deportment becomes the practice. And we can see how this reflects back into our daily lives. Bringing that practice off the cushion. If we care, are more aware, are humble, moderate, and can get outside of ourselves, we can create more harmony and equanimity around us. And it comes down to those little moments in our day. Is my area clean for the next person? Am I offering help? Should I apologize? Am I showing gratitude? What am I learning? Am I easing someone's hurt? Am I doing and being better? Five seconds to check in and to say, I can do better. Because the answer is always yes. <laughs> it is our practice to find those ways to be more compassionate and engaged. Meditation, ritual, coming together as Sangha, these are our methods to practice how to be, how to develop wholesome virtues. It comes down to the doing, how we behave, how we demonstrate respect and gratitude. To, and it all shows how, we, how much we care, how we feel. Because otherwise, we may show a lack of caring, an inflated ego, a, a, a succumbing to desires and anger and ignorance. The form, etiquette, and behaviors during our practice are a way to reinforce 
and demonstrate the importance the teachings have to us in our daily lives. Um, thank you so much. Uh, before I open it up to questions and comments, um, I would ask if, if Ichishima Sensei or Mongshin Sensei would like to add anything additional to it. Ichishima Sensei, do you have any comments you would like to make? Oh, thank you. Um, Please, thank you so much. I think it is very important to be humble uh, mind. And Gasho uh, meeting uh, with Buddha. And so in Gasho, I think uh, the right hand is Buddha, Buddha himself, and the left hand is my hand. So meeting with Buddha, this is uh, Gasho form, I think. And the very important things for us to accept the uh, Buddha Dharma, we have to be humble our mind. Uh, so our, uh, <laughs> Uh, as uh, Asanga, pioneering uh, uh, of the India <coughs> uh, Yogacara uh, mind on the school, he really uh, first uh, uh, realized that uh, when he uh, walk, uh, meet with the uh, goose, you know, goose baby drinks milk out of water, only uh, you know, it's very difficult to separate milk and water in a you know, mix together, but the goose baby can drink only milk out of water. I think this is a very uh, interesting uh, parable that uh, uh, when I was uh, in middle school, I uh, had a goose baby and uh, I, I found that, uh, you know, goose baby drinks only milk out of water. When we pour water into the water, uh, milk into the water, we cannot separate milk out of water, but uh, goose baby can um, separate, uh, uh, you know, drink only milk out of water. So I think this is very interesting. And, uh, uh, clean our mind is very important, and so uh, I think uh, we have um, so many things we accepted in our mind. Mind is called the store consciousness, Araya Vijnana in Yogacara. And uh, but uh, when we uh, really clean our mind, just uh, humbly, uh, you know, or uh, accept the teaching of Buddha, then that that teachings just penetrate into our our consciousness, and then uh, we receive gradually only <clears throat> the teachings out of uh, water. I think this parable is very interesting. But thank you very much for your, you know, interesting topics of how to be humble uh, in mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Thank you, thank you, thank you, I just wanted to repeat again something that you said at the beginning, and, and that was that many people... Oh, can you get a little much? Can you, can you speak up a little? Sure. Sorry. Um, at the beginning, you were mentioning that people will walk into the hundo and they say, well, this is so Japanese. Why do I, why do I have to do it that way? But we have to keep in, in, keep in mind that when a Japanese comes and sees what we're doing, they're saying, this is so American. <laughs> because they look at it in, a, in from their perspective, what we're doing is really much more American. We're looking at it being Japanese. What we're doing is Buddhist. <laughs> now we're doing Buddhism as it is in Japan, but as you mentioned, much of what we think of as Japanese culture came out of Buddhism. <laughs> so therefore, it wasn't that we're doing it the Japanese way, we're doing it the Buddhist way. and. Of course, this is a Japanese school of Buddhism, so we follow those. If, if we were a Vietnamese school of Buddhism, it would look a little bit different. On the other hand, if you locate it in a New York, New England area, it's still going to appear from the outside um, Japanese, but for the Japanese, it does appear very American. So we have we've taken the core essence of those things which are Buddhist, 
and we haven't done just the Japanese things. We would, there would, if you were in Japan, you would still be doing it a bit differently. Mm -hmm. Just, mm -hmm. just to let people know that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, it, it does make me think of how how the doshi, the leader of the, um, the leader of the service, walks up towards the raihan, the towards the altar. Uh, they stop and bow and then approach. In the same way as they leave, they they don't turn their back on the main image until they step back. And it seems very uh, imperial court. But again, imperial court got, got it from how the Buddhists were processing in and out. Of Tatami the, mats came from Buddhism. It didn't come right. from Japan originally. The cadence of how they walked, you right. know, set the, set the length. Anyway, okay, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, any other questions? Or? And I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah. So that